Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Pat Higgins. I'm the president and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. And it is so wonderful to see you all here for our Summer Survivor Speaker Series. Thank you for joining us today. You're in for a big treat. You're going to hear from Julie Mittal Berman, who will share the experiences of her parents, Magda and Les Middleman, who were both Holocaust survivors. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our community partners for the Summer Survivor Speaker Series. Attitudes in Attire, Green Hill School, Legacy Senior Communities, Southwest Jewish Congress, Temple Shalom, and the Texas Holocaust, Genocide, and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission. We're very grateful for these organizations' support and partnership at the museum. I'd also like to give a, a warm um, welcome to our volunteers and members who are here today. If you are interested in getting engaged with the museum and would like to become a volunteer or a member, we would be thrilled to have you be part of our family. You can go to our website and get information about both. Um, and if once you join as a member, you'll get information about programs like this all year long. So in just a moment, you will hear from Julie, and then we'll have time for questions from the audience. Um, if you are joining in person today, you can use the card provided to you at check-in and write out your questions. And our staff will come around and pick up the questions, and Julie will do her best to answer as many of them as possible. Um, if you are joining us online, use the Q&A um, function in the chat box, and um, type out your question and we'll make sure that we answer those as well. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Julie Mittal Berman. Thanks. Well, hello everybody. Um, nice to see such a nice crowd in the middle of the summer. Thank you so much for coming out and spending your afternoon here at the museum. So like Mary Pat said, my name is Julie Mittal Berman, and I am a daughter of survivors. So let's get started. So because I'm a daughter of Holocaust survivors, I'm considered a second generation a second generation survivor, even though I'm really not, it's my parents. So since I'm their daughter, that's what we're called a second generation. And this story that you're gonna hear today is going to be about them. It's not about me at all. So these are my parents, Magda and Les Middleman. Cute little couple, don't you think? And the picture in the middle is on their wedding day in 1945. My parents came from Hungary. Hungary is a country in East Europe. Um, and as you can see from the map, it's completely surrounded by other countries. So it's landlocked. And it's not a very big country, but as compared to Poland and Germany. So if you had to get away quickly, it would be very difficult because you'd have to go to different countries before you can get out of Europe completely. My mom came from a small town called Solnok, and my father came from a larger city called Debrecen. Can everybody hear me okay? So life before the Holocaust was pretty much like your lives, like my lives, every, you know, everything going okay. My mom's side of the family uh, was not wealthy. They were fairly poor. My grandparents had to work, both of them. My grandmother was a seamstress, so she made dresses for people. Back then, you didn't have department stores where you can go and just get pick up a dress, so people had their clothes made. And my grandfather was a salesman, so he traveled quite a bit. And the middle picture is that of my mom when she was three years old and her older sister. And the last picture is uh, a picture of the whole family at a wedding in 1939. 
probably the last time the entire family got together before the war broke out. My mom's side of the family was not religious. Um, they went to synagogue on, on the holidays, uh, but basically they were not religious at all. My mom went to a public school, and this is her class picture from when she was 16 years old. My father's side of the family um, was a little bit better off than my mom's side. My grandfather had his own business. He made furniture for people. Um, it was a family trade. His father made furniture, and his father made furniture. And many times after school, my father would go and learn the trade from him. My grandmother was a stay-at-home mom. She had uh, four boys and a girl, or three boys, I'm sorry, and a girl. So she was busy. They were also a little bit more religious than my mom's side of the family. So my father went to religious school. And as you can see, that's his class picture. Um, he was the, guy, the one with the red circle around him, scrawny little kid. Um, and he also sang in the synagogue choir, but he didn't really care for it. So most of the time he would skip it and go play soccer instead. Well, Oops, uh, sorry, sorry, jumping ahead. So 1939, Germany invaded Poland and the war began. Hungary was not quite yet in the war. But they were, they were sympathetic to the Germans. They were on the Nazis' side. So the first order came that all the men, all men, over the age of 18, had to enlist into the military. And soon after that, all the men who were Jewish had to start wearing an armband, a yellow armband, so that they would know who they are. And soon after that, they took all the men with the yellow armbands and formed them into work battalions. And these work battalions were basically slave laborers because from that point on, they could have no communication with their families and they couldn't go home to visit. And they were taken to different parts of Hungary to start building uh, and preparing for when the Nazis actually, at some point, will come in and take over the country. So one of the first places where my father was taken was to a small town called Solnok, and that's where our love story begins. So now, this is my father. You'll get to hear him tell you what he did in Solnok. Well, uh, there's some time, you know, uh, where we were, we were housing, there was a elementary school, and she had a friend maybe two blocks further, and they knew in the city a lot of Jewish boys there. So the Jewish girl, they came to visiting there. They saying, you need something, we can bring you, etc. There I met with her. And uh, I was there about 10 months in Solnok. And uh, that's the place was, which is the most comfortable, well, because I get a very good friend, one of the Hungarian sergeant who knows I, I met with the girl and I want to go to visiting her and sometime he take me out from the camp to take with to let me go there and he picked me up later to go take back to the camp. So even though the Germans had not invaded Hungary yet, anti-Semitism had, had gotten very, very bad. So in the next video, you're going to meet my mom, and she's going to tell you how she had to start wearing the yellow star. They, they, we get the, the yellow stars. We had, a, we had a to wear the yellow stars, and we can go out on the street. My mother, everybody had it to make by, self, by herself. They, my mother did it, and I was putting on, on my coat on my dress also, because I had a job, and I went to work with my, you know, with the yellow star. So after 10 months in Solnok, my father and his unit was shipped out to the Russian front. So the Russian front was the border between uh, Poland 
and Russia, or the Soviet Union by then. And so this was the first time where my father actually came into contact with Germans. Up until then, he was under Hungarian rule, and if you, if you heard his entire testimony, he would, he would have told you that sometimes the Hungarian uh, military and police were even worse than the Nazis themselves, the way they treated their prisoners. So now in the next video, my father's going to tell you what he had to do on the Russian front. And there we get a German. And those Germans, they were taking us to they, next to their barrack, and they used us for putting down mines. They signed up an area where we had to put mines there. They show, show, how, show us how to put, or cleaning mines. The first day experience what we had, the two boys blow up on that minefield, what they put them up. They didn't do that right, they were careless and step on the mine, what they not ever put it down, because they didn't mark them. So I'm actually very lucky to have these two pictures that shows you with my father with the Hungarian army uniform and it's from the Russian front in 1943. And you can see where the arrows are pointing and my father with his unit. And you can notice how the yellow armband uh, is on them so that everybody knows that they're Jews. So as they're going all along the Russian front putting down landmines, the German in charge found out that my father knew how to build things because he used to go and work with his dad. And so, when a wagon full of their supplies broke down, the German in charge told my father, I'm gonna send you to the next little town to get this, the wagon fixed. And so he did. He sent my father with, with a guard, of course, to the next little town where they found a blacksmith. And, and as my father walked into this blacksmith's place, the old man who owned it looked at my father and started crying bawling, just crying. And my father said, why are you crying? And the man said, because you look just like my son. You remind me of my son, and I haven't seen my son in three years. He said, I don't know if he's dead or alive. He said, the Germans came in here, and they took him away, and I haven't heard anything since. He said, you come in here and sit down. I'll bring you some food, and I'll do the repair work for you. I said, great sat down and he had a really good meal for a change. And when the old man was, was done fixing the wagon, he said to my father, before you go back to your unit, I want to tell you something. I want to show you something. He said, come here to the front door. And he went to the front door and he pointed out and he said, you see there in the middle of the town, that hill, right in the middle of the town square. He said, that hill consists of 3,000 Jews. 3,000 Jewish people from this little town and the surrounding areas were rounded up with the help of the community and brought here. They were made to dig a ditch, and then they were shot and buried there. He said that hill did not stop moving for days. He said that hill will be here forever to remind the people of this town how they collaborated and helped the Nazis. So by now, it was already 1944, and now Hungary joined the war. They actually joined the Nazis, and the first thing, of course, the Germans came into Hungary and took over everything. So the first order that came was that all the Jews had to go to the ghetto. So the ghetto could have been a building, it could have been a neighborhood, it could have been a city block. Depending on how many Jews lived in that town, depended on what the ghetto would be. So Solnok was a pretty small town, and so the ghetto was the school building. And in these pictures, you can see how they're moving some things in on a little wagon, and you can see the Hungarian policeman standing there. He's looking pretty pleased with what's going on. And in the second picture, you can see how they're boarding it up. So once people were inside the ghetto, they boarded it up, and you can't go to school. You can't go shop for your food for your family. 
you're moved in there, they give you a ration of food, they take you out if they want you to work somewhere, but you're basically, you're a prisoner in this building with everybody else. So in the next video, my mom is gonna talk about going to the ghetto, but before then, she's gonna talk about a chance that she had that a German tried to help her uh, to leave and why she didn't. First, that he was in Romania, and he saw how the Germans, they, I mean, they people, they picking up children on people on the street, from the street, throwing up on a truck, and they just taking it. And he told they will happen here too. Don't stay here. Go away from here. Where to go? Now where to go? And he told me that he is he's giving me a uh, address in Ber Berlin. And he told, go to Berlin. And I give you an address where to go. And I told him, I'm not going. I am not leaving my parents. I am going where my parents will go. And then one nice day there came two policemen and I told you have to pick up all uh, the, your things, not too many things, because you are going to the ghetto. So we picked up some bad side, you know, bad things, uh, a pillow and a comforter or, and a couple of things, dish, and on a little buggy and, and we just pull it in the ghetto. So a few months after being in the ghetto, an order comes and it says you're going to be deported, which means you're going to be sent away. They didn't tell them where they're going to be taken. They just said you're get gather up some things, not too many things, and and we're going to the train station. So in the picture, you can see where, in this picture, where they're being marched down the middle of the street, heading towards the train station. You can almost see the bottom of a German soldier as he's leading them to the train station. But what do you see on the sides? What do you see on the sides on the street? You see people standing around watching as this whole group of people are being taken away. These are their neighbors, their classmates, the people who they shopped with, people who shopped at their places, people they grew up with. They're just standing there watching as the entire group is being marched away and they're just bystanders. They're just standing there. Hey, I'm not Jewish, I don't care. And then the second picture, they're at the train station, and you can see the looks on their faces. They're confused. They don't know what's happening, where they're going, what's going to happen. So in the next video, my mom is going to talk about the deportation, and she's going to call the boxcars uh, wagons. Some people call them boxcars. Some people call them cattle cars. She called them wagons. Oh, nobody was telling us anything. And we was going with the second transport. The first transport went in Vienna. We didn't know that. The second transport went to Auschwitz. We didn't know where we going. And we was in the in the train on this day and and on the way to Auschwitz. Were there other people on the train? All on the train was full. And the train was full with people. We hardly can sit down. How old were you? So I was 20. Well, they was rushing up us to the second, to the wagons. They was, they was even pushing us up on the, on the, on the wagon. Who was pushing um, you? The Germans. And uh, there was 
we was about in this in this way in this wagon i mean there was about five which one going or maybe more uh there we was about a hundred people in this wagon and uh, there was also an old man on the other side in a wheelchair they was putting on with the wheelchair and uh, we start to go we didn't know where we going but uh, we just moved out and we was about three days on the on the road was going when we saw a chimney two big chimney in the in the distance and they was burning there was the flame was high up on the sky and my mother told us that well i don't know where we're going but you get ready that maybe we're going right in the flame and uh, i don't know why but i just didn't feel anything anything i saw the flame i didn't feel anything and then we was we was uh, we went closer to the place then we we smell the flesh the burning flesh and uh, finally the train pulled in and stopped so when she says that they were going for three days straight that meant they were moving for three days there were no stops there were no stops for food there were no stops for water there was no stops for bathroom breaks they were stuffed in these wagons, a hundred people or so inside. You barely had enough room to stand in one place, let alone sit down or lie down. So in less than two months, Hungary, once it joined the war, deported 440,000 Jewish people to Auschwitz. Out of that 440,000, 320,000 were murdered as soon as they arrived in Auschwitz. So that's a huge number to really wrap your brain around. So let's say in that first row over here, there's 20 people. That would mean that 15 out of those 20 would have been murdered as soon as they got to Auschwitz. So now she's arrived at Auschwitz, and here in these pictures, you can see that everybody's coming off the trains, everybody's rushing around, trying to find family members, trying to figure out where are they, what's happening. And you can see the policemen in, in the front, and you can almost hear them barking orders at them to get organized. And in the second picture, you can see how they are a little bit more organized, men on one side, women on the other. Notice how many more women there are than men. Remember I told you all the men over the age of 18 had been already enlisted. So the only ones who were still left were the ones who were too old or too young. So in the next video, my mom's going to talk about the arrival. There was all our relatives and I was waiting until they come in dawn. And then I looked in and I saw the door open in the other side. And there was the flame. And the soldier who was open the door, they pushed down the wheelchair with the old man. And then I was running after my mother and we drove us. It was dark. It was evening. It was raining. And my mother picked some towels and we put on the head and we started to going when I looked back on the men's just still was standing there in the in the you know court like my father outside but we went when we went it was light because all the reflectors was on and we, I saw when we passed it there was a a hill of baby shoes and right beside this there was an older hill with eyeglasses and I told my mother where we are going and I 
from this fence there was a, a fence and the women were standing there and hollering that give the babies to the mother, give the babies to your grandmother or your mother. But they, they was keep, you know, hollering to us. And we passed this part and we went to a bathhouse. And then we went through all this cleaning of the hair on the body, on the whole body. Well, they was coming also behind us to the same place but when we when we started to go i was looking back he was still standing there on the first lane in the in the men's section and and i saw my father he was he was looking so sad and so poor with this long winter coat on her uh, on him and I just wanted so much to go back to tell him a goodbye. But they was rushing us and we went in in this in this bathhouse and they cleaned up us and then after the the cutting of the hair we went to the shower and when we came out from the shower they gave us some rags to, to wear at which one one of them was this short, the other was this long, so we was trying to change him. So when we came out in a bigger, big, big room, there was the men's already, but very few men's was came back from the shower. There was there wasn't more than a dozen. So you understand that the showers, they never knew what was going to happen. You can go walk into the showers and it's water and you have a shower, or you can walk into the shower and it's gas and everybody inside dies. So like she said, there wasn't more than a dozen men who came out, again, because they were either too old or too young to be of any use. So now she was in Auschwitz, and you can see how in the, in the barracks, things are not comfortable. They are stuffed in there, as many people as, as they can get in. There are wooden bunks. There's nothing there to make their life comfortable. There's no mattress to lie on. There's no pillows. There's no blankets. There's obviously no heat or air conditioning. They are in there sometimes four people to a bunk, sometimes more. Sometimes they only had room to sleep on the concrete floor. And in the second picture, you see a group of women who must have just come through a selection. In the next video, my mom is gonna talk about selections and what, they, what that meant. But you can see here, it's a group of women who, you can see how their heads had been shaven off, and they have some kind of a uniform. So they were probably chosen to go do some work somewhere. So she's going to talk about a Dr. Mengele. Has everybody heard of Dr. Mengele? No? So Dr. Mengele is famous from Auschwitz because he was a physician, a medical doctor, who enjoyed doing all kinds of experiments on people without any anesthesia. He was very interested in twins. He was very interested why some people had bigger heads, smaller heads, jaws that stuck out, jaws that didn't. So he would do all these experiments on these people and many times, if they survived, most of the time they didn't, they were left with lifelong problems. So my mom's gonna talk in the next video about the selections. The selection, we went out on the, there was a big plot, big place before, you know, the right in the entrance, and they was taking at us, and uh, naked. And then I saw first time Mengele, Dr. Mengele, and uh, she, he was selecting. He selected out my, my cousin first, and uh, she went on and then a couple of weeks later they tried to do it 
to hurt us. On the holidays, they always selection. There was always selection. On every selection, Mengele showed up. The second selection was about in, in uh, Rosh Hashanah. And then they selected me. And uh, we were sitting there on the, on the uh, plots, upper uh, plots they called, and uh, waiting for, uh, you know, to go. You know, they take it to the, to the, or in the, in the shower, or right to the station. But usually they give it some normal dress before, you know, they send it to a transport. So, but we were sitting there on the front of the, you know, entrance and, and was waiting there. And I was thinking about my mother, that I leave my mother and my sister and, with my younger sister, I always felt she she was always very, very thin and my mother always worried about her and I just I was worried too and I didn't want her to leave them. And then I just jumped up and I started to running. And there was a, a, a German soldier who was a, a priest in civil and she, a bunch of women around him and listening, you know, his uh, predication. And, and then I just crawled in, in the middle. Okay. And then saw the, the post who, who was after me. He lost me. So I went back to my mother and sister. And we was there until Yom Kippur. And I was an order selection. And I, they selected my sis and then I was I was smarter because I tried to hide in. And uh, and I selected my sister and my sister was went. My sister was gone. Later, you know, they was making a selection again. And I was every selection I was hiding. And I never, I never was in my mind that they will select old people or not young people, because until this time they always was selecting the young people who they take at work here and there and everywhere. And this time I was, I was hiding and my mother was on the selection. When I came back, I find out that my mother is not there. I was running out on the street and I saw my mother is marching, you know, marching there with a, a, a bunch of women. They all has a white hair. And I started to running after her and hollering her, but in, I don't know, he didn't hear me. And I was keep running on the, on the block Alteste, you know, who was responsible for everybody. He was, she was running after me, and she was trying to find on me. And she told, you have to come back, and don't worry about the people. Don't worry about my mother, where, where she went. Then, then she was telling me that she was taking, she by herself, was taking her mother to the gas chamber and I, it wasn't filled me better, I tell you the truth. So now her mother, her sister and her cousin were all gone. But soon after, she's left there all alone, all of a sudden the Germans said, we're going to transport a bunch of you to another camp in Germany. Because what was happening was that the Russians were starting to come across the border into Poland. And the Germans were afraid that they were going to try and liberate Auschwitz. So they decided to send two train loads of people to Bergen-Belsen. Bergen-Belsen was another concentration extermination camp deep in Germany. So if you've ever read the story of Anne Frank, 
Anne Frank was also on one of these two trains. And so she was taken to Bergen-Belsen, and when she arrived there, she found that conditions were even worse there than they were in Auschwitz, if you can imagine. There was hardly any food, there was no sanitation, people were dying everywhere. But she found her sister and her cousin, both of them, alive. But soon after, news came that the British were starting to come from the west. So the Russians were starting to come from the east, the British were starting to come from the west, and the Americans were coming from the south. And so the Germans, again, were worried that, that Bergen-Belsen would be liberated. So they ended up taking a large group of prisoners on what they called death marches. So they were moving them deeper into Germany to actually be able to, at some point, exterminate them. Anything, because by that time, the Germans knew they were going to lose the war. But the main purpose continued to be to kill as many as they could. So I'm going to leave my mom there on the death march, and then I, we're, go, we're going to jump back to my father. Remember where we left him? He was putting down landmines along the border. So now the Russians are starting to come across that border, and so the German in charge started moving the entire unit into Poland, further into Poland, away from the border. And as they're going, a wagon breaks down again, one of their supply wagons. And the German in charge tells my father, pick a couple of guys, and you three stay here at the side of the road, and you fix it, and when you're done, you come follow us. And he took the rest of the unit and moved on. And as soon as they were out of sight, my father looked at his friends and he said, I'm not an idiot. I'm not following him. Forget it. And the three of them took off. And they took off into a nearby forest. And when they got into the forest, they came across a group of people. And these people told them that they were partisans. They were resistance fighters. And they said, if you want to join us, you can join us. What we do is we go out mostly at night and we'll sabotage. We will blow up their tunnels. We will blow up the roads, the bridges. We will steal their supplies. We will do whatever we can to allow time for the Americans, the British, and the, and the Russians to get here and liberate Poland. So my father and his friends joined. And what he found, that in this group there were Jewish people, there were Catholic people, there were uh, every, kind, any, every de denomination you wanted. There were men, women, they were Hungarian, they were Polish, they were Russian, they were uh, everybody who wanted to join, joined. So this group was called the Polish Home Army, and they consisted of many groups who positioned themselves all over Poland and fought back. So in the next video, my father is going to tell you what happened when he w joined them. So he was in Warsaw. This is the Warsaw Uprising, not the ghetto uprising, but actually the Warsaw City Uprising. The, Russia, the Warsaw was on the German occupation. Germans, they were there. The ghetto was burned already. And uh, they knew it. It's uh, we have to go in because the Russian getting close to the river. And uh, another side, Wisla. That was the name of the river, which is cut at Warsaw. Half one side. Uh, that was name of the river Wisla. One side was Warsaw city, and the other side some suburb or that one. So they expected there the Russian. We was planning to stay there on opposite side, the German side, you know, to anything what we can destroy there. We were 18 people there. And uh, we were hiding daytime in the houses. And the evening we went out. The second evening, I was together with one of my friends and uh, the big guy and uh, with another, with uh, Smith, and uh, 
we was playing with the machine gun, we were set up with the machine gun. And the German patrol who came around there, and that's what we were holding them up. And uh, we had to move back because they were coming up, the Germans, with the tanks. So we, we moved back about five miles from there, about five miles, about an hour, hour and a half walk back in the forest, so not to find us. And there they had a, some small place building some kind of, of storage something we pulled them there to to sit there during the daytime the germans they know they have groups there around that city which is guerrilla groups and they want to get rid of it and the german airplane germans took us they came at daytime looking us and they find that building because he turned back and we, when we saw it turn back, we jump out from the building and some ditches closed there. We lay down there. They started to hit bomb, uh, bombing that building and they shooting machine gun. So that building, what we had, I just started, we went there when we got there to sleeping there. I took off everything, just the pants in the shirt I had there. And there I had the watch in my pocket that I get from my girlfriend when I met with her in Sonor before we left. He gave me a silver watch, a flat one, what they were wearing in the small pocket. I left there, so the watch is burned there with my everything else. And uh, we were lucky because we get away without any scratch. But the German gone and we went, try to go back to the unit. So we get back to the basic unit and the third day we went back to the Warsaw again because every night a different group went there so the third night was our tour or to go there so I went there we were sitting on the top of the storage place a higher place we are sitting there and the Germans they were patrolling and they show us up there on the hill on the top of the building and they started shooting us and we was replying there and I was in the machine gun and Sam he was with me with the belt which is the heavy dead you know they call them and the bullet to get into the, the gun and a minute I said Sam I don't get supply I stuck what are you doing I look and get Sam Sam, Sam had no head they cut with, with, you know, they were shooting them with the machine guns, and uh, I don't know, they, they, they were some kind of uh, grenades, and the, probably that one of them cut his head. Just he had no hair right next to me. Oh my God, I said, I had full bloody. And behind the building was my friend who was preparing to fill the belt with the bullet. I said to, to him, Reisner, uh, let's go from here because uh, the gun is gone. We have no way where to stay here. And we tried to go, getting darker that day. We tried to go next to the building. We were laying down behind them. And we know we had a plan to 10 o'clock evening to get to one spot where we're supposed to get together to moving back further. And uh, evening at the evening, I said, no, right, we have to move. So we started to going slowly and they were shoot up those uh, candles, like with the air, the shooting up candles, which is coming back down with the parachute and they light up the whole area. So when they shoot up, they picked up us with the light and they started the shooting the first cut what they get in I get hit they hit me my leg a uh, couple of places my legs get hit from here down and I couldn't stand up on it and uh, I am telling to my friend Reisner Reisner I can't stand on my legs would you help me to go try to get to the house he said to me you crazy how can I help you? Everyone is going to die here. I can't help you. I can't help myself. And he left me there. 
so I was staying there, you know, the biggest wound was my knee, and I had to tear my sh shirt and try to clean in the top like that, but I couldn't move. So I would stay there about to get completely dark, and I tried to crawling from there. And again, you know, the, the candles went up in the air, and they saw me there, and I got a second time. And they shoot me that time on my arm, my head, and on my back. So I was there. I couldn't move. I was bleeding there, and I left there unconscious. And <clears throat> I waked up next couple of hours later, probably. They were carrying me, they carrying me on the stretcher to Paulak. They're taking me somewhere. At that time, I have to mention to you, I was wearing a Hungarian army uniform. What we was taking during the time when we were in the, in the guerrillas, they were robbing one of the storage places where they had the armies there. So they didn't know who I am. They know I had a wearing a uniform, which is not Polish, not not uh, uh, Russian. They know the Germans. That's a Hungarian uniform. So they are carrying me the first aid place. They took me a first aid place, and the two boys who they are carried the uh, stretcher, they know me, because they were part of uh, there. But they get caught with the uh, Germans. They caught him. And uh, one of them is telling me in my, in my ear, don't worry, Magyar. That's the way the Polak called the Hungarian. Don't worry, Magyar. M-A-G-A. Uh, because we're not going to tell them who you are. So my father was shot 13 bullets across his body. And... As he said, he was picked up by the Germans and taken to a field hospital where a doctor operated on him. And he, probably during the surgery in his delirium, my father probably spoke and the doctor realized that this guy is Jewish. So when my father woke, woke up after surgery, he found that he's in a room all by himself, away from all the German soldiers who were in that field hospital. And the doctor would come two or three times a day and would change his bandages and bring him food and basically saved his life because he quarantined him away from all the, the Germans and he nursed him every single day. So after about three weeks in this hospital, one night the doctor said, tonight, when, I, when it gets dark, I want you to crawl out the window and leave here. He said, because we are being sent back to Germany and the Russians are going to overtake Warsaw City and we're heading out. So my father on crutches snuck out at night from the hospital and started to make his way back to Hungary. The war was coming to an end. So as you can imagine, Germany was, and Poland was being bombed consistent, constantly. Everything, everything was bombed. The train tracks, the train stations, the, the city was completely a, a big mess. And people were trying to get home. People who were survivors, those who can still manage on their own to get home. There were soldiers who were trying to get back home also. German soldiers, Polish soldiers, American, it, British, everybody was, it was very confusing. And so, as they're trying to make their way home, as you remember, my mom was still on that death walk. So, she, in the next video, she's going to talk about how she was liberated. Hang on, a little glitch here. Well, we was, we was working in the factory until March. In March, they was coming the British, and uh, we had had to, you know, move from there. I mean, they wanted to take back to Bergen Belsen, so we went on the road to, 
to work onto Bergen Belsen, but Bergen Belsen fell to the English, to the British, and they can take there. So we was walking to Bavaria. Walking? For the walking to the mountains. We was walking usually in the, in the night, but sometimes we was walking on the day too. It was snowy and slippery and true to the mountain where it was terrible. My sister was all the time with me. I was watching her carefully. I was taking care of her how I can. And uh, when we arrived in Dresda station, when we arrived there, there was an air raid. On the Germans, they just, they just shut, closed the doors, and they ran to the, to the bunkers in Germany. And uh, in the middle of Germany. And uh, we was, we was, you know, praying in this way, con because this, you know, we was up and down, jumping up and down on the on the the first train, and then we went on the road, and we was going to a, a really wooded area, you know, lots. I mean, not wood, trees area. Both side of the road is trees. And we was going on a friend of ours had an infection in the leg. And uh, we was helping her on the two side and carrying her little bag. And when we passed a little boot house on the side, then I went inside and I just pushed them out behind the, behind the little building. And we were standing there all the way until this whole big transport is passed by. We went in in this village. We just picked up a house and we went in and we asked some food. And there this lady invited in and gave us some sandwich. And when we left, she gave us a bag cooked potato. potato. And she came out to the door with us and she told, this way coming the, the, the Russians, on this way they coming the Americans. And then I told to my sister, okay, let's go to America. And we went on this way and we find three soldiers was coming on the bicycle. So now everybody had to make their way back home to Hungary. So my mom had to go through Germany, through Austria, and back into Hungary. And that, that was, a lot of it was on foot because, like I said, the trains and the train tracks were all bombed out. There were cars once in a while or a truck that they could catch a ride with, but most of it was done on foot. And so it took a few weeks to get back. When she got back, she was looking for family members. She didn't know who survived, who didn't survive. But at the same time, she thought, I don't know if Les Smith has survived. So she decided to send him a telegram to Debretson, where he came from, and to say, I'm back, come and get me. And then she went to all the different little towns where she used to have family members to see who came back. But every time she went to a different town, she would leave a note. If Les comes, tell him I went to that town. And in the next town, if Les comes, tell him I went to that town. So my father was also making his way back home. So he had to work his way from Poland back through what today is the Czech Republic and back to Hungary. When he got back to Debrecen, a day after his mom and his older sister arrived also, which was really a miracle because most of the older people and the very young did not survive. But they came back also and he got her telegram. So off he went to Solnok to find her. And when he got to Solnok, he found a note that said, I went to this town. So he went to this town, found another note, I went to that town. And so he followed her from town to town until he finally caught up with her and they were married the next day. And you saw their picture right there in the beginning. So they were trying to put their lives together again. 
But a couple of years later, Hungary decides to become Soviet, part of the Soviet bloc. My father said, that's it. We are done with Hungary. So he and my mom, and by then my older brother, had to escape because you don't, just don't leave a communist country. So they had to escape. And they had to go over the border to Austria. Just like in the movie, The Sound of Mu Music, it's just like that. They, whatever they could carry on their back is how they had to leave. So they made their way to Austria and from Austria to Italy. And from Italy, they, they took a boat to Israel. Israel in 1949, is a brand new country, just got its independence. And guess what was going on? There's a war going on. So first thing my father had to do was join the military there and fight for the reestablishment of the Jewish homeland. I was born in Israel in 1953. And in 1964, my parents decided to come to the United States. So we came to the US and in 1986, my parents joined me here in Texas, where my father always said he has an East Texas accent, if anybody asked. <laughs> so in conclusion, I would just like to leave you with a message from my father. By the way, this is a picture of the family that has grown out of that love story. But the message I'd like to leave you with from my father, he, he, when he did this testimony, he left a message at the end for anyone who might watch, watch it in the future. And the message was that if you think that something like the Holocaust could never happen again, you're wrong. And if you think it can't happen here in the United States, you're very wrong. And if you think it can only happen to the Jewish people, you're dead wrong. He said, it can happen before you know it. It can happen overnight without you even noticing. He said, always, always pay attention. Do your homework. Don't just believe whatever the, the media or the newspapers are telling you. Do your own research. Find out the truth. Always keep an eye open. And if you see something, don't be a bystander. Do something about it. Don't just talk about it or shake your head, oh, it doesn't affect me, because someday it'll affect you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. Julie, I'm moderating questions from over here. Okay. <laughs> I think we have time for a couple. If you have a question on your note card, hold it up. We've got staff and volunteers coming around, or you can ask on Zoom in the Q&A. Um, let me start with this one, Julie. Did your parents have any lasting health effects? Your dad was shot 13 times. Your mom was in, a, was in Auschwitz. Did, did that affect them later in their life? Yes, they did. Uh, my father had uh, three bullets still in him on the day he passed. They were bullets that were lodged in such places that the doctors were afraid to remove because it could have caused more damage. And so he had a lot of, uh, a lot of pain, back pain from that, that bullet. He's, um, so he, he, my father was not a complainer. You would never know that he was in pain, but he was. And my mom, my mom had um, a lot of, I don't know how many of you have heard, a lot of survivors often have guilt feelings for surviving. You know, why she, was, she survived and so many others didn't. And so she, she had a lot of, of that, uh, especially later on in her life. Another question, what happened to your mom's sister and your dad's sister? Um, my mom, my mom, she had two sisters, actually. Uh, one of them had, the older one had left uh, Hungary before the war uh, and went to, to Israel. And the younger one survived. Um, actually, the younger one uh, ended up in Dr. Mengele's laboratory. And um, she survived that only because a nurse felt sorry for her and lied to Dr. Mengele that she was already at, at uh, death's door and that he shouldn't even be bothering with her because she'll be gone. But she survived and had many health issues later on. 
And your dad's sister, they also asked Oh, that. my dad's sister, she survived also. They, sh my dad's sister and his mother um, actually went to Austria, were taken to do hard labor in Austria, so they weren't in a concentration camp type of thing. So they, that's how the, uh, they survived. Got it. Um, did your father ever talk about how he felt as a Jewish man who was conscripted essentially to, to, well, for labor mostly, but for an ally of the Nazis, was he afraid for his life during the time that he was with that group? Yes, of course. He was, um, I mean, he, it was a very hard time at that time because the Hungarians were sometimes, like I said earlier, more brutal than the Nazis. And um, they would put them through unbearable um, torture. And I mean, if you didn't comply exactly like they wanted, then it was not pleasant. pleasant. Yeah, he was always afraid for his life. He always thought that probably on the, in that landmine uh, on the border that he would be, he would make a mistake and step on one. Mm -hmm. And now I think our last question, Julie, how open were your parents about their stories when you were growing up and what inspired you to kind of tell their stories for them to keep that legacy going? So my parents did not talk about their situation at all, their story. I was actually 40 years old before I found out their entire story. So when they did this testimony that you're watching here today, that's when I finally heard their story, because up until then, they wouldn't talk about it. I knew that they were in the Holocaust. I knew there was something different in our household. There was always, you know, a lot of whispering, and if I would ask questions, oh, you know, they would quickly change the subject, or you shouldn't know such things, and they tried to protect me. Um, but when they finally agreed to do this testimony, and I got a copy of it, and I sat down, by myself and heard the entire story. Sorry, um, I changed my life, yeah. and um, and that's when I decided I am going to tell their story and let people know so that something like this could never happen again. Because people don't know; people have no idea. Well, thank you, Julie, for sharing your parents' story, for speaking about it. It's an important one to hear. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we do have three more of these sessions this summer, July 7th, July 21st, and then August 4th. So we hope you'll come back in person or virtually. But let's give Julie one final round of applause. Thank you, Julie.